if you're using Entra Privileged Identity Management or PIM, there's a good chance that it's not giving you the security that you think it is. So in this video, we're going to jump into the Entra Admin Center. We're going to explore five common mistakes that Threatscape find when assessing tenants as Microsoft Island Security Partner of the Year. So let's get into it. Mistake number one for Entra ID PIM that we're going to look at is that the checkbox for requiring MFA may not be giving you the protection that you think it is. We're going to jump into the Entra Admin Center. We're in Privileged Identity Management. I'm going to head to Microsoft Entra Roles, and I'm going to pick one as an example. So I'll head to Manage Roles. This gives me a list of all the Entra ID roles. Let's pick Global Admin. That's always a nice, easy target, something we really want to make sure we're protecting. I'll head into Settings. So this lets me control the PIM settings for global admin, and I'll hit edit. One of the things that we would commonly see is what's on the screen just now, where it says on activation require Azure MFA. Where the mistake creeps in here is not that there's anything intrinsically bad about the setting, but you just need to be aware of what it does and doesn't do as part of your threat modeling. So when you authenticate into Entra, or really any kind of Office 365 resource, if you have already required MFA, then that session will have previously satisfied MFA. And when you go to activate your role, in this case, a global admin, it will not ask you to do MFA again because it can look and it can say, hey, you've already done MFA. So we can tick that box and say, hey, you're good to go on and proceed. That's expectation that we find a lot of customers don't have where they think, oh, well, this will force the admin to do MFA again. And why would we want to do that? Well, let's take, for example, token theft. You can check out on the Threatscape channel other videos we've done on things like adversary in the middle attacks and token theft. But if an adversary steals my tokens, if that token has already previously satisfied MFA, when they go to activate a role, it can just use that existing claim. In that case, the requirement to activate a role, functionally, it doesn't actually give me any type of security. Now, that brings us on to Entra ID PIM mistake number two. And that is where we're not leveraging something called authentication context. We're going to stay in the same page and we're going to look at the option below Azure MFA for activation. And you'll see here it says, oh, mouthful, Microsoft Entra conditional access authentication context. Try saying that three times in a hurry. If I drop down here, you'll see I've got a list of what are called authentication contexts. And you can think of authentication contexts as reinforcing conditional access in the middle of an app experience. Now, an app experience in this case for me is going to be privileged identity management, but it could also be something like SharePoint Online. So what's going on here? I have a list of authentication contexts that I've created. These aren't available out of the box. And I'm going to choose the one that is most important for our use case here, and that is re-authentication. This in and of itself won't do anything yet, but you can maybe see where we're heading. So we've got description of require full re-authentication. We're not going to tick that Azure MFA and we're going to use that authentication context. I'm going to just leave this as the defaults for the purpose of the video and we'll hit update. Like I said, it doesn't actually do anything yet. To require it and actually force it to do something, I now need to head to conditional access. I'm going to jump to my policies. I'll show you one I've created already. If you don't have this, you can create one based on what you're about to see. And I have a conditional access policy. That was a little naming convention I got going. And by the way, let me know in the comments if you're interested in more stuff on kind of well-architected conditional access design, naming conventions and all that good stuff. You'll see under my conditional access policy, if I scroll down to target resources, I'm then targeting an authentication context. And it's the one I just chose over in PIM, right? I'm going to go down to session now, sign in frequency of every time. Let's join all those dots. What's going on here? Well, what I have done is I have told privileged identity management, when someone activates that global admin role, don't necessarily rely on the existing authorization. We're actually going to reinforce authorization by kicking conditional access in one more time. And it's going to be this policy that does that. So not using Azure MFA, but we're kind of just forcing the user to reprove they are who they say they are and that they're authorized to elevate into that PIM role. So that's commonly seen mistake number two is not leveraging that capability. Mistake number three that we're going to touch on or PIM and Entra ID is the misuse of this option here, require approval to activate. And I'm going to touch on really three kind of misuses that I see of this. First off is overuse. When we require approval to activate, it does what it says on the tin. And it means whenever I need to become this type of administrator or activate this PIM 
role, someone else has to verify, hey, yeah, you can go ahead with that. Bottom line is that can really, really slow you down. That may be good in terms of an adversary. It can slow them down. Practically though, if you're doing the rest of conditional access right, and you've got all sorts of other layered approaches to identity security, just don't abuse it. Maybe keep that in place for things like global admin that we're looking at. You can wrap it around change management processes. But if it's a less privileged role, maybe like your help desk folks, if they constantly need to activate user admin, is that appropriate or is that really just a nice way or fooling yourself into thinking you're getting some degree of security, but you're actually just really, really annoying. Now, the second mistake that we kind of commonly see with this require approval capability is actually the opposite. And that's where it's underused. Like I said, in earlier mistakes, we have to be really conscious of this threat of token theft or generally the accountant being compromised. So it is actually quite a useful capability of if someone's account is compromised and they're eligible to be, let's say, for example, or most privileged roles, like global administrator, well, in that case, it does actually contribute to an element of defense and depth. I guess the point here is don't abuse it, but also don't completely write it off. Mistake number three that we're going to talk about in privileged identity management is about this one here you'll see on screen. Require approval to activate and not appropriately considering its use cases. Let's talk about this. First off, are you overusing it? Need to create a Microsoft 365 group? Needs approval. Need to view billing statements, needs approval. Need to release an email from quarantine, needs approval. That's a really good way to annoy your admins without really getting a lot of security benefit. The other thing to consider about this is maybe you're underusing it. This goes hand in hand with general over permissioning admins. I don't know if over permissioning is a word, but it should be. So want to pim up and get God mode via global admin? Go for it. Level one service desk person who just needed user admin, maybe you should actually be using this more than you are. And then also just in general, this can be quite often misunderstood. Now, why is this capability preferable in some regards to both requiring Azure MFA and even authentication context? Or does it at least complement those? So what I'd say about this is, look, if you want the overhead and general annoyance with requiring an approval flow for everything you do, go for it. But there is approval fatigue in the same way there's MFA fatigue, right? And are you really checking the person who just messaged you to approve a role is really that legitimate user? Or do you just go into autopilot and approve anyway? You ideally want a balance. And for me, that is based on how privileged the role is. And that takes me to misunderstanding the real benefits to requiring approval. It's great for internal, legitimate administrative control to either enforce or audit these privilege and potentially block changes outside of change windows and so on and so forth. What it's really great for, however, is a second security boundary that protects compromised accounts. So think about it. Previously in this video, we spoke about how requiring MFA isn't token theft proof. Depending on your authentication context and its strength may not actually help either, but requiring approval with a real and enforced approval process, now that kind of is token theft proof. And let's run through what I mean by that. An eligible admin account is compromised, either only requiring single factor or, or maybe with a stolen MFA claim. That compromised eligible admin has no standing permissions, all has to be done through PIM. Really all they can do is head to the PIM page and request permission. They might be able to form read only reconnaissance, but that depends on the entry ID config. So that compromised eligible admin fails the validation process for requests. And by that, I mean that real, are you who you say you are process. That's not a great situation to be in, but you've identified a potential breach and it could have been a lot worse. And hopefully that illustrates the value both of not inducing approval fatigue by requiring it constantly, but by requiring it for really highly privileged roles. Fourth, intra ID PIM mistake that we're going to cover is not having mitigations against role lockouts. In this video, we've just discussed approval processes. You may also be familiar with the concept of emergency access or break glass accounts. And there's several ways to address emergency access accounts, but the most common is a group. And then that group is excluded from all your conditional access policies, that kind of idea. The point of this PIM mistake is that you need to implement emergency access accounts to protect PIM roles too. If you're already doing it for conditional access, you're probably covered, but Let's talk this through and talk it through with a scenario. Let's say we require approval for all admin activation. That admin, that activation, it must be approved by other eligible admins. And that's a common scenario that kind of is based on this idea of 
two keyed lock, that kind of idea. You're trying to follow recommended practice by only having a few global admins. Let's say you've got three global admins. One is active, that's not you, and the two other are eligible. This scenario would be much worse if you only had two, by the way. All your three global admins, one's on holiday and they're unreachable. The other one's unreachable because they're sick. And you know what? Maybe let's just say they've exited the business. So for whatever reason, those other two admins are unreachable. Now you try to activate them, but you require the approval of admins who are no longer with the business or on holiday, and you cannot activate that role. Worse still, if you reach out to those available admins, they can't log in because they deleted MFA from their phone or something like that. Point is, if we're going down the route of requiring approval to activate PIM roles, we always have to have a highly monitored and tested break glass method to get back into those. I like the idea of a static emergency access account that is constantly assigned global admin, and then just lock that down with some additional conditional access policies and monitoring the heck out of it with things like either Sentinel, Azure Monitor, or even Defender for Cloud Apps. The fifth enter ID pin mistake that we're gonna look at in this video is all about PIM for groups. Number one, are you using it? And number two, are you understanding all the consequences of it? Let's talk that through. So we're gonna head into PIM in Entra here, and we're gonna to go to Manage Groups. I've got one that I created earlier. If I head into this group, you can see the idea here, where we get to apply PIM principles, but to groups. So I'm gonna take the name of this group and I'm gonna search for it up here. Let me go to the group page. And from here, I can go down to activity management. And you'll see that I can either make users active or eligible for a group. So it's just in time principles or group membership or ownership. That means I'm not always in the group, but when I wanna be in the group, I can activate PIM. It just drops me right in there. And then my time's up, yoink, pull me right back out. So it's really good for the use case of if I'm managing permissions of something with a group. So let's take Purview, Intune, Exchange, things like that. Admin rights in those quite often we'll manage with a group. You can apply PIM principles to those with PIM for groups. This was previously, I believe, called privileged access groups or something like that. So that's the first point. Mistake that we quite often see is folks just aren't aware and aren't using it. However, now that you're aware of it, you have to be aware of a design choice that can have unintended consequences. In this case, this group is, if I go to assigned roles, you'll see here this group has an active assignment of global admin. That means any members of the group get global admin rights. And you can apply this to any type of admin role. If I go back to the PIM page and I go to eligible, you will see here I have a user that is eligible to join this group. What does that mean? It means a de facto they are eligible to become a global admin by a membership of this group. Now, if I made that user eligible to be a global admin without the group, as a direct global admin as signee is eligible, they would get certain levels of protection. For example, a user administrator, which is considered a lower tier, not a privileged role, they wouldn't be able to reset their password. And the reason for that is we don't want a user admin to be able to reset a global admin's password because it represents a way that that user admin could become a global admin, right? It's kind of elevation path. If I use PIM for groups and I have an eligible user, I do not get that same level of protection. Bottom line here, I guess you could say, is be aware of PIM for groups, understand the use cases, and there's some really cool ones, but probably stay clear from it for those highly privileged roles. If you want to explore additional Microsoft 365 security capabilities, make sure you subscribe to us and check out this video on securing BYOD and Microsoft Intro.